Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mikola, and I have a confession to make. I do test, and on production. <laughs> when I first realized this, I had a feel, feeling of sorrow because I thought that this is a sign of deficiency in our testing strategy. We should test everything before we go to production. And the excuse of lack of resources and time, it was a little bit of a week. But we kept doing this, and over the time, I started to get used to this, testing on production, start to enjoy it, and I started to see it more as on an opportunity rather than thin. This is what I would like to talk about today. So a sketch of the plan. First, intro, a little bit boring part. Many people find it, but I think it's important to give the context where I'm talking from, or where I'm coming from, why uh, this works for me. Then I will go into examples. My favorite technique is shadow, shadow runs. There will be three examples. Other techniques, a little bit uh, operational concerns, a reflection and conclusion. And I will be using this droplet as a reminder to me to keep my mouth hydrated. And if you have questions, I would like to keep uh, some uh, time at the end, but if you have something sh uh, short or something doesn't make sense, this would be a good moment also to ask. So I work at bold.com. It's a Dutch uh, web shop um, and also a platform for e-commerce. Um, it's a small if you look from the US side, but in our country it's re relatively big. It's e-commerce, so we don't have uh, planes that will be crashing if we do a mistake. Uh, we don't have people dying, but we still have quite some value. I googled it yesterday because I didn't really care. But uh, we, last year we apparently did almost 2 billion sales in euro. And we're growing every year about 30 to 20% depending on how you count. That part does make influence on, on my work. So if we do, if we, we have some uh, place for an error, but if we make an error uh, because of the volumes, because of the scale, it can be very quickly quite costly. So, and I'm working on the backend. I call it deep backend, backend, so it's not a backend to which frontend is talking, it's more behind the queues, behind the asynchronous processes. Mostly my experience is in logistics area and in purchasing. We have some frontend. But they are mostly used for internal purposes, so we don't have that much uh, complication with UI testing. So that's a disclaimer. Because of the nature of our product, we have only one production environment. So we don't ship our uh, code to anyone else. We don't deploy it to uh, mobile devices or Mars rovers. But this uh, environment is highly volatile. We have more than 60 autonomous teams that are doing their deployments in their own pace, doing their changes. Um, we have microservices environment with more than hundreds of microservices, dozens of bigger, not so microservices, and a couple of big legacy monoliths under the hood. So with this context, what I will call testing on production, I will not spend much time here on testing, on testing conference, but for production, for the, the purposes of this, presentation, I will make a distinction between three types of environments. Going from left to right, how we deliver usually our uh, changes. The most important is on the right, the production. That's where our value is generated. Technically speaking, that's the only environment that we need. The rest is an overhead. But we might need that overhead because any change to production can disrupt the value flow. And one of the ways to minimize this risk is to test things before we deploy them to production. In isolation, by isolation I mean running a small piece of your application uh, somewhere on your local uh, development workstation on continuous integration service in a, in a highly controlled environment where things are very predictable. Or on staging environments, there can be multiple staging environments which try with different precision to emulate production. But in our experience, it comes with a cost, which I will touch a little bit later. So that was the theory for today. And now we'll jump into the example.
So first example, to give a little bit of the business context. You don't have to read it, it just make it a little bit exciting, some pictures. Um, at bold.com, bold.com is a platform, so uh, retailers can sell via our site. And in the normal flow, they will get an offer, will sell, and do the uh, shipment returns and all the logistics themselves. But we also provide a service which is called logistic via bold.com, where they can send their stuff, their goods, to our warehouse. It will be sitting there, and when an order arrives, we will take care of shipments, of uh, all the logistic dirty things for a small fee, of course. And uh, I was involved in one service which was working on calculating those fees, those costs. So what would happen, we would listen, we would listen to events in our environment, like shipment in this uh, picture. And when we detect that this is a shipment for something that belongs to our partner, we would uh, invoke couple, some business logic and produce multiple uh, financial microtransactions for shipping costs, pick and pack costs, commission, that's what we earn for providing those services. All is nice and simple, nothing fancy, working, everybody is happy, and then business requirement is coming to make things better, a little bit more complex. The idea is that shipment depends, the cost of shipments depends very much on how you ship. Are you shipping everything in one big box? or you are having 10 different separate shipments to the same or different customers. So the idea is to be more fair to our uh, partners and look how the shipment was spread over the customer order. So we would listen to the customer order, this will correlate uh, customer order to shipments, we'll also need to listen to the cancellation because it happens very often, and only at the end, when the whole order is fulfilled, we will produce slightly adjusted micro, micro payments. All is good and simple. We did implement the feature, uh, tested it in isolation, even did some BDD. We tried to involve product owner, as usually was not very easy, but we were confident enough in the functional area, but we still had some hesitations. On the technical side, we, we introduced the distributed locking because we're running on multiple nodes and we need to, we had to uh, lock an order for the moment when we're doing the calculation there. That was a new technique for us, for our team. So we didn't know, know for sure how it will work on production with production load. We also knew that sometimes we would miss some messages. We didn't know why exactly, but we knew from experience. And that was not a huge problem when we were missing them in small enough numbers for the original implementation, but in the new one, when the whole order would be delayed because of that. We were a little bit concerned whether it will be a showstopper for us or not. So we're trying to replicate those situations on staging, play uh, in isolation, uh, but it was always difficult to exactly replicate the situation, the load, the patterns, distribution patterns that will be on production. So we decided why not just to go to production and test it there, because production is there, Things are already happening there. And we did so. So this is a very simple example of the shadow run. Within the same application, same deployment, instead of replacing old functionality with the new, we're building a new functionality next to the old one. And at the very beginning of the processing, we would do the fork of the incoming message. In this case, it was very easy because we were message driven. So we would just subscribe to the same topic with a new uh, shadow uh, queue, with a new subscription, and all the rest would be completely isolated from the main flow. So we will do the new calculation and then produce a new shadow transactions in a separate table. What is very nice here is that it's very difficult that something goes wrong because they're quite isolated. The consumers, they use the uh, live data and the need to say explicit, I want to use the shadow data. We did this run for two months, that because, and that was two months is two billing periods to collect the data. We found out that our concerns were correct about the missing messages, but, and we also uh, managed to quantify it a little bit better, but that was not a showstopper 
and we could build a simple compensation mechanism. We also found that our distributed locking was, lock was working fine, no problem. A very nice bonus of that was that during these two months, our product owner got a full uh, specification for every of our partners in the shadow, from which we could produce examples of how the new calculation would look, which simplifies the transition on business side very much. And one thing I forgot to mention when I'm saying that is difficult, that, that is uh, relatively safe. Theoretically, you can do uh, something wrong can happen here and you will be running out of memory or something. Not very likely, but to make sure that you can quickly uh, stop negative effects, we would usually have a simple feature toggle here, which will say, just keep the messages, acknowledge them so that they don't pile up, do nothing. Never had to use it, but it's always good to have. That was the first example. Second example, slightly different. Same application. For some reasons, we had to switch from Oracle database to Postgres, which is a great thing if you're a developer, because Postgres is much more developer friendly but not so great if your organization doesn't have much operational experience with Oracle. And if you are a business owner or business stakeholder of a financial data exposed to third party partners, and you know that you, uh, your service will be the, the guinea pig, con uh, proof financial for this transition. So we decided again to do a shadow, a slightly different shadow. So we would have different deployments for life and shadow. It could be different, uh, uh, this could be a different code base. In our case, we use the same code base. We just made our application work both with Oracle and Postgres and just configure it differently. And then the live will be saving data to Oracle database. Shadow will be saving to Postgres. If everything goes well, all those table, uh, the, the data is equal. All the paths, both, uh, variants were fully tested in isolation, also with dockerized databases, real Oracle and Postgres. So we were actively developing still the service, it was not blocking anything. And uh, we were waiting till uh, a good moment when we can finalize this migration. And then when we were uh, ready, we would repoint the live application to Postgres database. The consumers would keep talking to it. There will be, in our case, a small downtime no problem for us in this in this case. And then we will decommission the shadow uh, instances and kill the database, the Oracle database. So a very nice side effect of this was that because the data was supposed to be absolutely the same, we could pinpoint the earlier problem I mentioned that we would be missing sometimes the messages and correlate them to very strange, strange bugs in our libraries that we are using. Small things, but nice. Some problems, well, some concerns that we should be aware of when we are planning uh, shadow run. First is ID or reference generation. It's very nice if your IDs or references are generated outside of your shadow area, then you can just use them and it will be fine. But sometimes we would use some ID generated within shadow for some flows. For in our case, that was a business screen where the compensation corrections would be made. So they would find the transaction that they don't like and they do a compensation based on the ID. The ID is generated here. And of course, in the distributed environment, it's not really feasible to have the same ID generated in both life and shadow because of many reasons. So that's one, of con one concern. In our case, the workaround was very easy. We just ignored in, our, in all of our uh, comparisons, the data generated in this flow because it was easily distinguishable from functional and audit for purposes, but can play some role. Another concern is the initial staging. It's very nice if your application is simple, doesn't depend on the state, you just receive some message, or some event, and do some output. In our case, we had some initial states like existing shipments, existing orders from which we, we were starting our 
uh, processing of every new uh, message. So before we are starting the shadow run, we had to do the initial load to copy the data from, in this case, from Oracle to Postgres. In, in this example, we were doing some downtime and playing with, uh, with uh, consumers and of the incoming messages. Uh, the very good bonus, the good, uh, very good uh, side effect of running in shadow that you can do a couple of times this initial synchronization and check that it's working properly. Uh, and in our new projects like this, what we, are, what we found very useful is persistent message brokers like Kafka. Because then you can move here the synchronization and listen to historical data, not only from the moment when you started to listen. And that means that you can replay it from the moment where you want to start collecting your history. Yes. License. Because Setup. Last example of shadow. I love shadows, but I don't want to spend too much time in shadow. This is a little bit more uh, involved example. In this case, we were uh, dismantling a monolith, an existing functionality, to give a little bit of a business feeling. It is a cross dock functionality. The idea is that you can get warehouse order for an item that's not yet in your warehouse. And then the warehouse normally just sends uh, the, or the items of the order directly from inbound to outbound, bypassing all the internal stages. On our side, uh, we were looking at this a little bit broader. Basically, we were comparing demand and supply on what we have in warehouse and what is planned to be coming. And if it was not enough, we would be ordering automatically more for new orders. The, the functionality was existing, but in a, an old monolith. Uh, and what was making the transition a little bit more complicated is that it sits in between two domains, logistics and purchasing. So there were multiple teams working on that. The good thing is that we, had, we had had enough experience with such migrations. So we, from the beginning, we agreed to do it in shadow from the very beginning. Uh, and it would look something like that because we were building uh, microservices, and when you start to build microservices, one is not enough. We would create four mo microservices. Uh, they would be processing all the messages in the shadow mode to the very end, and only at the end, uh, the messages, would, uh, the, instead of sending order to the supplier, would stop the processing and do the analysis. What was very nice in this approach, well, not only that we could build the whole functionality on production gradually by just expanding those services and learning how they interact with each other and how they interact with uh, other data suppliers because we need to collect lots of data and see if we have exceptions, why is it happening, how we are going to fix it. What was also very good that we could gradually go out from the shadow. So we could segment, we could take part of the incoming stream and start sending it as live to the new implementation while keeping the mold stream going the old way. This way we could learn how things work in a very small batches. What was also very convenient for us in this case, we could segregate per warehouse and per warehouse the requirements were also different. So for smaller warehouses, like big uh, fridges, you don't have releases of fridges that everybody is waiting. So we could learn much more there. Another very nice side effect of this was there's a business involvement, even though the stream which was going live initially was very small, was much more lively when something really happens in production than theoretically 
on some acceptance environment. If something was not working, we were getting much faster response, even though, again, the flow was much smaller. And when everything is done, we just switch it. Yes, so here, one, more, one important point in my experience is to think about how you toggle shadow and uh, light, especially if you have multiple steps. That's where we usually have problems down the road. Because most of the time you will need to uh, make some de some decisions, some depending on whether you are working with a shadow or life entity. And especially if you're going into microservices environment, these, these places can be multiple services disconnected from each other. And even if you have one toggle, some way configuration, and even if you can fully synchronize in a synchronous way, or maybe decide by the time, say when we're switching for some messages from A to B, from life to shadow, there will be still some messages in transit potentially between point A and point B. The possible is to put the labels on the messages explicitly. So all the messages in the previous example would carry, oops. so all the messages in the previous example would carry the flag whether it's a shadow, whether it's not, which is nice, but it all adds, of course, complexity and a little bit of space for, for an error. In our case, we had a couple of edge cases which we didn't handle very well. But at the end, the level of confidence was very much worth it. Oops, Oop. drink. So that was about the shadows. There are also other techniques. One of them we call it we call it gold, golden order or lucky customer. But today, from I heard the term the term dog uh, dog food eat, yeah, eating on dog food because we are using our website ourselves. We often can be the first canary tester or canary tester of a new functionality. For example, a couple of months ago, I was involved in uh, some refactoring of a big existing functionality, and I was a part of the pilot group which will say, show us the data on our website about our account in the new way. So we know that we are part of this pilot. We know whom to contact if we see something wrong. And it's much less dangerous than exposed feature to the users. It was even more uh, spectacular when we were uh, starting to use a new warehouse where the project manager, leading project managers of this project would make first order, it would be reserved specifically for him, and everybody would be walking with the cams and making films and promo videos, how this first box goes through the whole huge warehouse and is being delivered to this, uh, to this guy. And then when you have enough confidence, you can go maybe for bro uh, broader population. A little bit more formalized technique like this, and it's already on the border of uh, release strategy, is to have an explicit configuration, explicit rollout somewhere. In this uh, example, I'm showing a small part of the supplier configuration screen, which is used by our internal uh, uh, business uh, operations, where it's a huge, and we're making it even huger for some features that we're building, where you can specify whether this particular supplier is working the old way or the new way. And then you can go first with a very small, a part of the population with a low risk, low volume, friendly uh, suppliers with, from with which you can easily communicate, or even test suppliers, you can create your own. And then when you have enough confidence, you roll out further. Maybe you find something that's not working very well. Edge case is not nece uh, necessarily a uh, software edge case. It can be, in our case, mostly some contractual things that were not sorted out properly. Then you pose for that su uh, supplier, the customer, roll out further, go back and fix the remaining one. What is very nice about this the way of working, from my point of view, then we can push the responsibility, or give the responsibility for the migration to the business operation, to people who know much better all the details about our suppliers than we can possibly have. So that it can take longer, more time, and if we have A and B life and new and old functionality, 
very much different and can incur costs in maintaining, maintaining both of the branches. So in this case, we will be trying to push and monitor how fast are we going with the migration. I mentioned test accounts. We don't use much test accounts at bold.com. Mostly it's used by the business operations to check that some things are working. But I know some people who are using test accounts to even to do automated testing on production will be resources a little bit later on this. Another techniques, technique which we use on production and I find it very useful is to extend, to add test APIs, to extend normal APIs for testability and troubleshooting. So in this case, it's a, uh, it's a screenshot of a Swagger interface uh, which exposes an, uh, an API. It's accessible to the business people, to the business analysts and product owners. And in addition to normal parameters, which a normal service would, would uh, use, it also adds, for example, calculation date time. So the moment when this calculation will be performed. Because this particular uh, call depends very much on the time of the day when we're making it. So this way we can do acceptance testing just on production with the realistic data. It doesn't have a side effect, it just returns you uh, what is our expectation. And later when question arises why something happened, it can be one of the tools that helps to narrow down very quickly where things probably went, not as we expected or we just expect our expectations are wrong. My Previous example, uh, examples, especially the shadows, it was about asynchronous communication. Sometimes we want to do, we have some synchronous communication, like asking some service for some data synchronously. So we have our service, us, our API, uh, which we would not call, and then we would do a REST call to some other service. What we found useful also is to make a shortcut and expose this test API. Before any of our processing, maybe with, with um, side effects maybe with some entities created. Just how do we interpret the response from the other service? And this helps, first of all, to find the edge cases. You can, when you have this uh, endpoint and deploy to production, you can see, can we talk to this uh, other service? Uh, go through some uh, examples, do we interpret as we expect? And also later again, when things start to go wrong, or, or you think that they are going wrong, you can very quickly zoom in directly to this communication by passing the logic and side effects. And the last example for today, but my favorite. This is all the examples I was doing, uh, I was involved myself. This was from, an, uh, from another team, but that's really cool, I think. So there is a service at bold.com. It is called Pacman. and its responsibility is to do the picking algorithm. And what does it mean? That uh, from time to time, every five or 10 minutes, uh, the service gets a batch of the warehouse orders for warehouse. And then, then it needs to produce the orders for the people who will be going and collecting the stuff in which sequence. So it's highly critical because if it doesn't work, then as, as a peak season, uh, thousands of people just don't have anything to do. And a lot of our customers are not very satisfied. But is, there is also a lot of uh, room for improvement. There is a data science team working how to optimize those algorithms and work uh, and learn uh, and teach and train the models. But these data science, they are also working with Python and it takes quite some effort to convert it to some language that we like to have on production like Kotlin and Java. So how the team is addressing this, these challenges? They have one central node which receives the batch initially. And then for every algorithm that they have, including uh, some uh, experimental algorithms, they have a separate node in Kubernetes cluster where they spread out all the same batch and wait for time to re uh, get a response. So some of these algorithms, they will be very proven and very predictable, but not the most optimal. Others will be much more, op much more optimized, but sometimes they would have edge cases and they will not return a response uh, quick enough. Some, they are not trustworthy yet at all. So they will wait to time out and return the best that they can evaluate based on the weight. This way they can learn on production. Of course, technically they could have replayed 
especially this one is just by collecting data from production. But it's much more convenient when the thing is running really on the environment when you can see how it works. A common question to us in general, how do we do performance testing? In many teams, we, we used to have uh, performance tests for all of our services. In backend, we figured out as we are not really CPU, CPU bound, it's not our main bottleneck. We don't do uh, explicit performance tests, not on staging environments. Instead of that, we look mostly on the metrics, how the, how the things are working, and do some experiments. The most common is to shut down a couple of nodes, well, if you have multiple nodes, and see how the remaining are coping. It's not really a scientific proof how, because uh, the, uh, rarely the applications scale really linearly, but it can give you some indication how things are working. Is it as you, uh, uh, as you expect or not? Another very uh, useful technique for us, because we're on the backend with lots of asynchronous communication, is to pause some few consumer for some time. Wait till the backlog grows, and then release consuming uh, consumers. Maybe with, even with increased parallelization to see how we'll cope with the stress. So we also do sometimes a little bit of chaos engineering. Who knows here what chaos engineering is, or rather who doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> but actually, we don't do engineering. We do more like man monkeys. So what we do is, when we have enough confidence in some, in some flow, we can do some disruption, like deploy a, a database change which is backwards incompatible. Yeah, we, we know how to do it backwards compatible, but we expect that this flow is resilient, so we'll deploy. As we expect, there are a couple of messages will fail. We will wait till the alerts go off, see that the alerts are still working because things are changing. Maybe someone forgot to update an alert. When the alerts are we see that as alerts work, then we would uh, do recovery, and this is uh, controlled, and we uh, we know and what we expect we expect that this this is going to be happening. Whereas when we embrace testing on production as a first class testing environment, well, of course we cannot just go and start testing in production. We need to invest and take care of observability, so we see actually if something is going wrong in production. We need to take care of monitoring. Resilience, because things will be have, uh, going wrong, that's explicit, even though they will be going wrong anyway. But now it's also a part of our development that we will be <coughs> making things wrong. And a small side note, that's what many of my colleagues ask to, to repeat this when I'm doing this presentation. Testing on production doesn't mean that you can deliver un untested or bad quality code to production. Your code is supposed to be up to the production standard. Well, you can think of security. You don't want to uh, deliver unsecure code to production. You don't want to deliver a code that will be unpredictable uh, on production. Well, unpredictable from at least from the functional point of view. You can do some shortcuts on uh, swallowing exceptions and errors in some shadow flaws, but usually it's better to start building this quality from the beginning to see what's happening there. The examples uh, that I was showing, I saw them in this, they were working with teams with different levels of maturity of, uh, with different types of tools and not necessarily all of them were working very agile and very quick. It's still possible to do things like shadow runs. What we found useful is to have feature toggles, especially if you have a, very, uh, a slower release si deployment cycle. So then you want to react on things that are happening uh, faster. In our recent experience, because last two years we were doing trunk-based development with continuous delivery, it means that our development branches are very much uh, synchronized with uh, main development branch, and that one continuously synchronized with production. We have actually less need in feature toggles because some, often we can just deploy a new change without a need to feature toggle. Both of the options are fine. Microservices are not really strictly required, but what, how it helps is to determine the blast radius. It's much easier to 
know the effects if you have a small smaller service. Yes, theoretically you can have a good monolith, well, well uh, designed, well uh, with good isolation of internal components. I haven't seen them. Maybe uh, microservices help us in this respect. Although theoretically, again, you can have cascading effects if some of the uh, microservices start to misbehave. But well, as we are not uh, again performance bound, not CPU bound, for us it's not a huge problem. Can be. Dynamic infrastructure helps, especially with, by dynamic infrastructure, I mean ability to spin up new nodes and new services within minutes uh, without involvement of operations. That helps a lot for sh building shadow, especially when you want to have shadow uh, separate from your live uh, components. Uh, not necessary, but helps. And this is the last droplet. In my, I think that testing on production is an opportunity. Well, at least that's how we experience it. Partly it's, uh, we were forced to do this because our acceptance, we could not get enough value from our accept acceptance staging environments. But now we see that often we can just go directly to production and it makes our processes lighter, faster and cheaper, most of the time. I don't say that we should do it always. Sometimes we stay a little bit on acceptance, but most of the time. Yes, in our experience, maintaining staging environments is not trivial for many reasons. And this is the mental picture that, I, uh, that we have now in my team and in many teams around us. Not all, because Bull.com is not autonomous team, everybody decides their own way. So we spend most of the time in two places, in isolation building feature, with test-driven development, ex uh, functional, what we expect there. Uh, we usually quickly skip through the staging environments and go to production and learn there what's happening. I will be sharing this uh, presentation. Uh, while preparing the, it, I found these two YouTube uh, videos were quite interesting. The first one was about a team, a company, organization, they don't have any acceptance environments. They just go to production. It's a little bit too extreme, but it's good to learn from the extremes. And they have rationality why they don't want to go, uh, why they're doing that. Another one is quite, uh, it's a short, about seven minutes, but even the name is uh, cool. Sufficiently advanced monitoring is indistinguishable from testing. And there, it's even more interesting if you watch it. Uh, 